Okay, so for those of you who are new to my trainings, my name is Tyann and I am a Team CBT trainer and ever since January, so I'm actually a fairly new trainer, but I just really love Team CBT. I feel like it's just lit a fire in me to just spread this treatment approach as far and wide as I can. And, and that's one of my reasons for having these free webinars, because I just truly believe it's life changing, not just for the clients we serve, but for the therapists who practice it as well. And since we're talking about anxiety, this is my favorite book from Dr. Burns. It's called When Panic Attacks. So if you're wanting more of the cognitive tools and even a little bit more information on some of the exposure tools, I think it is a little bit weaker on having information on exposure tools. So I'll give you a lot more information on those today. But it is just a great book that lays out all of the, almost all of the 50 basic techniques and uh, gives you basically examples and, and instructions on how to implement those tools, okay. So a quick overview of TEAM. TEAM is an acronym, and each of these are the key components that really create successful therapy and help people have real change in their lives. And so T is testing where we do measurement of where's your symptoms of anxiety. This helps us hold ourselves accountable that every session we're seeing results from the beginning to the end and if you're not getting better that's also additional information that will help us um, cater our treatment to really helping them and uh, seeing if the homework helps them in between the sessions too so as team cbt therapists we do um, measurement before and after every single session and a feedback form so we can just really let the client have a voice in their treatment Empathy, um, I've done a whole webinar on this. There's a whole book on it as well, um, but it's using the five secrets of effective communication to really connect with our clients. So when we're doing empathy, we're making sure we don't um, challenge their thinking process. We're really aligning with them, trying to understand their perspective, um, not challenging any distortions just yet. Um, agenda setting, we'll definitely hit on today a little bit more. And this is really the heart and soul of Team CBT here, where we really work to bring resistance to conscious awareness and then work to melt them away. And then once we do these three components, we'll be a lot more successful with our methods. So kind of the era of us, of a lot of us and myself included in the past is the clients come and we start to throw methods at them. And then that's when we'll sometimes see resistance and maybe they don't feel like they quite trust us yet to feel safe to move forward. Okay. So these are the testing forms that we'll use in Team CBT. This is the brief mood survey. And in every session, we're gonna measure their anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, and anger, and positive feelings. So we, eventually we want to see them not just feel less crappy, but to feel also more positive about life and themselves. Oh, and this is in Dr. Burns' toolkit. Once you purchase the license, you can make copies and, and we use this measurement for unlimitedly for the rest of your life there. Okay. So agenda setting, we have already gone over this if you've attended my trainings before. So it's making sure you invite the clients to transition from supportive listening into doing the active work. And when you get their buy-in that they're ready, that's when you're gonna be a lot more successful, right? So it's making sure you actually issue an invitation. So we're working with anxiety and trauma. You'd say something like, you know, you've shared a lot about your anxiety and trauma symptoms with me. And I dangle the carrot a little bit too with the invitation. I feel like we do have some powerful tools that can really help you through your suffering. Um, and wondering if this is a good time for us to transition to that, or if you need a little bit more time for me to hear you out and give you additional support, that's important too. So that's the open hands where I'm okay if you need additional support, but the tools are here. I'm gonna make an explicit invitation to ask you to transition from endlessly processing. Right? Uh, we'll get into specificity conceptualization for just for today. We're gonna to conceptualize it as anxiety. And, and trauma, and then we'll go into motivation as well. Okay, so with motivation, with trauma, and specifically anxiety, and then you're seeing symptoms of 
anxiety from the trauma that they've been through. We're going to see two things that come up, two types of resistance. And the outcome resistance, which is what is the reason as to why they may not want the change, right? They come in and they tell you they have all of these symptoms and they want to get rid of them. But often there's going to be this outcome resistance because if I suddenly let go of my anxiety and no longer have these trauma symptoms, um, maybe I no longer feel safe. So just a little bit more participation from you all. Just type it into the chat. What do you think would be the outcome resistance? So magical thinking is kind of just the umbrella term of like, usually it feels like there's a protective factor there. But when we do, when we address outcome resistance, what would be some of the good reasons as to why they may not want to do this work, even though the symptoms are kind of torturing them, they may have panic symptoms, they may be re-experiencing the trauma, they may have intrusive memories and flashbacks, but why, why may they not want to let that go? Okay, fear. So fear is a little bit more of the process resistance, right? What are they gonna have to do that they're not gonna want to do um, in order to get better? It's exposure, they have to face their fear. So fear is a big one that we have to address. Oh, I forget to um, turn on my other laptop to type in the responses. Um, Angela's saying it shows they care about themselves and others. Um, so keeping their anxiety shows they care about themselves or others. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more, Angel? Um, yeah, I was thinking, you know, they, they feel like if I don't have anxiety, it doesn't show I love them anymore. So they'd have to, they'd have to rethink their their expression of love and caring about people for them. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Um, like if I'm no longer anxious, like for example, about my child's well-being, then it, it shows maybe I don't care about them anymore. So the anxiety honors their caring, right? Let me give you a more specific example and then we can get into maybe a more uh, a, a beneficial discussion of the outcome and process resistance here. Um, yeah, some other great uh, thoughts here. If I don't worry about my anxiety, it'll sneak up on me. So as Jennifer is saying, there is a protective factor. If I'm not worrying, if I'm not hypervigilant, it's going to come up. What if something bad happens, right? So that's the magical thinking. If I worry enough, I can um, board off bad things from happening to me. And in the moment, it feels so true after they've been through a horrific experience. Um, Ashley says, if I don't have the symptoms anymore, I don't know what life will look like. So it's kind of scary. It becomes the known after you've been in the trauma, especially like my clients who've been through childhood trauma. It, it, it doesn't even feel like PTSD symptoms to them. It's, it's life. This is how I know how to live, right? So letting go of it, there's kind of an identity, identity piece, but a safety piece as well. Uh, sometimes anxiety helps me to be more alert. Exactly. If I let go of my anxiety symptoms, I'm no longer hypervigilant extra alert, extra fearful, then um, something bad could happen. So that's that magical thinking there. Removing anxiety uh, may take away some habitual motivation. Okay. Um, and Carmen, when you're talking about like trauma, is it like if they decrease their anxiety, they won't be as motivated to like maybe be on guard or protect themselves? Is that what you mean there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can see the magical thinking that goes on with a person who has been through trauma and while they're telling you they want to let go of these symptoms, there are going to be actually some very good reasons as to why they don't want to let it go. Okay, let me pull up my notes so I can have that. That's weird. Someone drew a circle there. Can you guys see that? For some reason, it showed up on mine. I know Jill had that issue in her training too. And then process resistance, and I'll show you how to address that is, um, let's say they do want the outcome and they're ready for the change,
but this is the thing they're going to have to do that they're not going to want to do in order to get better. And what we know is so key with trauma, PTSD, and avoidance is that we're going to have to eventually face the fears in order to get better. So tools for overcoming um, outcome resistance and improving motivation. Let me make sure. Okay, so this is supposed to say tools for overcoming outcome resistance and improving motivation. So this is just going to be scratching the surface. We do have a lot to cover in the next hour and a half. So I just want to give you a, a brief example of what I would say to a client. And then um, I, I just encourage kind of additional training and reading, whether you're reading the ebook or some other information to, to really grasp the concept, right? So the magic button, so let's say they now take in the invitation, they wanna do the work to get better from, from the trauma. Um, the magic button would say, you know, um, let's say there is a button that you could just push and without any effort on your part, you'd no longer feel these trauma symptoms. You'd no longer have to be so alert and on guard and you won't be as anxious anymore. In addition to these symptoms decreasing and even getting rid of them, um, you're also just going to feel more joy in your life. You're going to be more present with your love, loved ones and more engaged. Would you push that button? And most people would say, yes, I would push that button. That's exactly why I'm here. Um, I'm, I'm wanting to get rid of my symptoms and, and just enjoy life again. And this is when we start to get really paradoxical with the positive reframing. And we would say, um, the next step in this motivational treatment model is actually quite counterintuitive. And the next tool is called positive reframing. And I'm just very transparent with my clients about what tools I'm using so they can become their own therapist and reuse it. And I would say the positive reframing actually argues that there may actually be some really good reasons to not push that button right now. Uh, for example, your anxiety, your hypervigilance is actually there to protect you. Would you say that's true? And of course they would say, yeah, I guess that's true. And then I would just um, say to them, uh, would, would this be something you'd be willing to explore with me? All, all of the good reasons to actually not push the button. And often it's tied to your value system and, and says some really beautiful things about you too. And, and then I'll do exactly what I just did with you all on, let's say the example is a client who's been sexually assaulted. And now she's really on guard, hypervigilant, checking the locks. She doesn't sleep with her door, her bedroom door open anymore. She used to. And um, just avoiding the space where the sexual assault happened. Right. Um, what does that? Sh how does that benefit her? And what does that show about her? That's actually really positive. When we go to that specific case, and and I'll just take a couple of examples so I can show you the magic doll and the externalization of resistance or voicing the resistance. The actual trauma symptoms, like the flashbacks, um, the anxiety around it, the hypervigilance. How could that actually be really beneficial and show something really positive about her? And you can either turn on your mic and open the chat to, to engage in a bit of a, a dialogue here, or you can just type it into the chat. Yeah, it shows she's doing everything she can to keep herself safe. And is that a good thing? And, and this is what I would say to her. Yeah, is that a good thing that you're really trying to protect yourself right now? What does that show about you that's actually really positive? So she may say it shows I, I really care about myself. And it shows I care about my safety and I don't want this horrible thing to happen again, right? Yeah, in the moment, in that time, it's a form of self-care, but there's truly a, a benefit that um, I, I do feel more safe, I do feel more comforted, I don't wanna put myself in a space where there's danger anymore, right? Yeah, other things that people say with those symptoms is that uh, not only am I alert and on guard, but uh, it shows I care about myself, I care about protecting myself, 
um, I'm warding off bad things from happening, though those symptoms can actually validate that this experience was bad. These symptoms give me a voice that I've been through something pretty horrendous. It wasn't just a small thing. So the symptoms being there validate my pain. So then why would you want to push that button to, to just get rid of it, right? And act like it was nothing. Uh, for a person who's been like a, a veteran, a man that I've worked with who had just been through a really horrendous experience with um, basically um, they were at war and they went to check on, um, they had a call about this mysterious object. They went to check on it. He had a bad feeling about it. And as he and his, uh, his buddies, his, his crew was going there to check on it, it, it exploded and it killed all four of his buddies and then left him just really um, badly wounded, like shattered his ribs. He fortunately has healed from all of this, but when we talk about really honoring their symptoms, again, we're trying to bring sources of resistance to conscious awareness as to why would you not want to let go of these symptoms? And like his reasoning just really moved me to tears when he said, the flashbacks are like my way of keeping them alive. And it still moves me right now to think about it, but we, we try to get rid of these symptoms for them, but we forget to honor the person that's having the symptoms that, gosh, the flashbacks shows his love for his buddies. The, the symptoms show, is his way of staying connected with them, right? And so when we honored that, there's, there was just a light bulb that came up for him that, oh, this is why he's been so resistant to doing this work because it, it showed his heart, it showed his love, it showed his loyalty. This is why he's kept their memories around for, for six years, right? Yeah, and Shannon's saying that's powerful. And it's powerful when we honor their symptoms in this way, in a flattering way, instead of just saying, oh, you just don't want to change, you're scared to get better. There's actually truly some very beautiful reasons and powerful reasons as to why their symptoms are hanging around. So that's the power of the positive reframing. And then when we go to the magic dial, um, we would have a pivot question something along the lines of, and imagine we already have an exhaustive list, right? Of all of the good reasons, all of the benefits of keeping their symptoms and um, all of the beautiful things it shows about them as a, as a person and their value system. We would say, considering all of these benefits and values, um, why would you want to do this work to change, right? And then we would go into voicing the resistance because your, your flashbacks, your pain is actually your way of protecting yourself. Why would you want to let that go? Your um, flashback, your pain, your, your hypervigilance is your way of keeping your buddies alive. Why would you want to do this work to let that go? And when I, I did that with um, my client who went through the sexual assault, she would say things like, it feels like it's protecting me, but it's also really exhausting and it's robbing me of living. The, my guy who was a veteran would say something like, um, yeah, but at the same time, they're dead and my kids are alive. And keeping, keeping these symptoms around is actually taking me away from the people who are alive, who still love me. And um, you'll see that when we voice the resistance and we side with it, they can just have this powerful voice of change, right? Oh, Jill saying it's beautiful. You're sharing your feelings with us about your client. Thanks, Jill. I didn't expect that to come up, but sometimes doing this work is just really moving work. And it's just really such an honor that our clients let us in to kind of do this soul work with them, right? This healing work, I feel like sometimes it's like holy work that we do with them to heal this hellish experience that they've been through. So they can fully start living again it's it's really moving and it's such an honor to be let into that space to do that okay tools for process resistance so this is when we're about to address the exposure so we know when we're working with trauma facing the fears is a really key point for their healing right 
And I love talking about exposure because we really don't have as much training about it. And we know it's so powerful in healing them. So the two things that continue to facilitate post-trauma symptoms is avoidance and then kind of negative cognitions about that experience where they're often blaming themselves for what happened or they start to interpret the world as truly unsafe in general. So those cognitions and the avoidance is what continues to facilitate it. So when we address process resistance, we would um, again do uh, some of the you know positive reframing, what are all of the good reasons to not face this? It's gonna be scary, it's gonna be um, anxiety provoking at first. Why would you wanna go there, right? So have them kind of argue for change. And then um, when I still kind of see hesitation in them, these are the steps that I would go through. So dangling the carrot is saying something like, um, you know, exposure is truly a, a tool that I've seen help people fully heal from these symptoms and start to live their lives again. And so you'll see we'll use specific outcomes that they want for their lives. And it's so a powerful carrot is a specific carrot that uses the outcomes that they want for their lives. And so if the client says, I want to be present with my loved ones, I want to not have the trauma have power over my life anymore, dangling the carrot would be, I see the exposure tools just have really helped people be really present with their lives again and no longer have the trauma symptoms take over and have power. The gentle ultimatum, though, is you're explicitly sharing what is going to be necessary in order for them to heal from this. And I would word the gentle ultimatum um, in this way. Um, at the same time, um, exposure really is kind of scary and it's kind of awful to, to go through. While I know it's a necessary step that will get you to the healing, it is going to be like us walking to the gates of hell together, to the gates of hell together and walking through it. The analogy that I really like to use with the gentle ultimatum is when we're working through this trauma, it's going to be like we're going to walk through this sewage pipe together. Right now you're in the space that's outside of the sewage pipe. Um, it's not the space where you want to live, but at least you're not in the middle of it, right? And when you're in the middle of it, it's going to stink. It's going to feel disgusting. You're going to want to run the other way. But when you run the other way, you'll just get back to the space where you're at right now, where you're not living the full life that you'd like. So when we do exposure, we really have to fully walk through that sewage pipe. And on the other side, it's going to be that sunlight. And it's going to be that fresh air. And it's going to be the clean water that's going to you know, help you sustain and live. But when we do exposure, you'd have to be willing to walk through it with me all the way, um, not just halfway and be stuck in that. And you'd have to be willing to do this at home as well when I'm not there with you. And uh, is that something you'd be willing to do? I could understand why you'd be hesitant to do that. So that's kind of a paradox paradoxical questioning, right? I could see why you wouldn't want to do that. Uh, is that something you'd be willing to do? And um, we have to be clear and transparent with them. It's really the most ethical thing because the truth is I don't know how to really help you reach your goals if we don't do this, this portion of the treatment, which is exposure. So you take on the blame. It's not like if you're not willing to do this, you're not going to get better. It's saying, I, I truly don't know how to be effective in helping you if we don't move forward with the exposure tools. Right? Um, if they're still kind of resistant, you don't ever try to convince them. Um, it has to be in their own time. So the fallback position would be, um, you know, if this isn't the best time for you, um, you know, please, please let me know when you're ready and I'd be more than happy to restart this work with you and do this treatment with you. And I'd, I'd be excited to do that, to get you to a space of, of healing in your life. And uh, another fallback position could be, um, and of course there are therapists who feel like it could be, they could be effective in treating this without exposure, I just don't know how to do that. And I'd be happy to refer you to someone who won't require that exposure of you. Of course, I'd be sad to see you go, but I'm more than happy to support you in finding the treatment that's a, a better fit for you, right? So explicitly saying, what, what is the consequence if they're not willing to buy into the gentle ultimatum, the conditions 
um, that's required for you to be successful with them. And open hands is, and I respect you either way. I can totally understand why you wouldn't want to go there, and I respect your decision. Okay, I just want to pause for um, questions or thoughts on the motivational treatment there, on those tools on addressing the outcome resistance and then the process resistance. That's our question on that. Okay, Angela, I see your hand up. Yeah, um, I was wondering, do you ever use the CBA when you're doing agenda setting or do you save that for another time? I honestly don't ever use the CBA. Um, of course, there are therapists who do. Originally, when Dr. Burns trained us in Team CBT, it was just the CBA. There wasn't the positive reframing table and voicing the resistance. Um, so I know like Richard Lamb um, and, and some others still use the CBA because they prefer it. Um, for me, I just use the positive reframing table and voicing the resistance, which I feel like is the same thing. But I think it's a little bit more powerful because with positive reframing, you're strictly just staying on the side of the resistance. The CBA then does what are the costs of continuing to keep your symptoms. But I like them to verbalize that through voicing the resistance. I think that's a little bit more powerful. And then measuring the win is kind of like when you're rating which weighs more on the CBA. Um, so for those who aren't aware of the CBA, the CBA is the cost benefit analysis, where traditionally when Dr. Burns was teaching team, he would say, let's list all of the benefits of keeping your symptoms and then now let's list all the costs of keeping your symptoms and there's nothing wrong with that I just think it's just a little bit more powerful when we um, kind of just do more of the role play of the positive reframing and then voicing the resistance I think both can be equally effective it's just dependent on your style there any other questions on addressing the motivation and bringing resistance to awareness to conscious awareness. All right, I'm gonna move forward then. Okay, it's covered well, no questions, that's great. And we've gone over those several times to the motivational tools. Okay, when you're treating anxiety, any form of anxiety, it's really important to use all four of these treatment uh, models here. I often have not found the hidden emotion to be as effective with trauma, like when it's an obvious trauma that they're having PTSD symptoms about, but sometimes it still can, can play a part to be really effective for helping them. So the motivational treatment model is part of agenda setting. That's what we just went over. It's very important to address resistance before we use any of the tools and have them be effective. When the client has the voice of change and, and it's winning over the reasons to not change, we're just gonna be a lot more effective in the next steps. There's gonna be a lot of cognitive tools that we'll need to use to challenge the typical thought patterns when they've been traumatized as the world is no longer safe and I'm incompetent in dealing with this, like I'm incompetent in, in living life, um, and often some self-blame thoughts as well. When there's been trauma, self-blame is actually there as a way to almost empower us, right? Because if it was my fault, then maybe I could do something to prevent it from happening again in the future. So we really wanna challenge those thoughts with the cognitive treatment model. And I usually like to do some of the cognitive tools first before I do exposure. You don't always have to though. And then I'm gonna go over some exposure tools with you. And then the hidden emotion is one of my favorite anxiety tools that you don't really see with a lot of other uh, treatment approaches. So the hidden emotion, it kind of has a little bit more of a psychodynamic background. And it says that whenever they're feeling any form of anxiety, whether it's just anxious symptoms or they're over worrying, intrusive thoughts, they're having panic attacks, um, hypochondria, I've, I've definitely seen the hidden emotion in that, phobias and OCD, you'll see that 
usually there's something in the here and now that's bothering them, but it's kind of threatening to address and they want to be nice. So they rather sweep it under the rug. And the moment they sweep it under the rug, that's the moment that anxiety comes about for them. And so it could be a person who um, is actually upset with their husband, but then they'll see more intrusive thoughts come or a panic attack comes, but it's actually because, you know, they wish their husband would be more involved or let me give you a specific example. Like I had a client who she started to have anxiety and panic attacks um, about three weeks ago. And then she came into treatment to see me. And then as we're exploring the hidden emotion, again, it's hidden for a reason. It's threatening to address. I would ask her, you know, is there anything that's possibly bothering you or upsetting you right now surrounding your husband? Because her intrusive thoughts were like typically a, a, about him getting hurt or him getting into a car accident. It's almost like her subconscious trying to kill him off, right? Um, and she'd say, no, you know, we really have a great marriage. There's really nothing going on. And then as we explored, and then you let it go when they say no, um, I, I just say something like, um, still the hidden emotion is, is often there when we kind of see this out of the blue anxiety. And so I'll, I'll just give it for you as homework to just kind of think about, is there anything kind of bothering you or upsetting you that's kind of threatening to address? And because you want to be nice, you don't want to rock the boat and it's being swept under the rug. So we did that for several sessions and by about the fourth session, she said, I, I think I know what it is. My, my husband actually uh, told my daughter that she can move back in with us, and he didn't really consult with me on that. And daughter is actually an active addiction, and it feels too overwhelming, but she thinks a good mom should say yes. A good wife shouldn't, you know, um, oppose her husband's decisions. And so that's when anxiety and panic attacks came about for her. And once we address the hidden emotion, like immediately already her anxiety had decreased from like eight to nine to like five out of 10, right? And of course, then we have to do some communication training. Um, I had her husband come in and she talked to him about this. And then anxiety just went from 10 to, to three and then she really had no more panic attacks from there. And so that incident actually happened about the exact same time when her panic attacks came about three or four weeks ago. So it's pretty powerful how our, our minds can reveal anxiety to tell us something's bothering us or upsetting us, um, but we're not quite consciously aware of it because we're, as a, the human beings, we're kind of conflict phobic. That's there evolutionarily to help us kind of get along with each other and um, just shows how nice and kind kind a lot of people with anxiety are but the hidden emotion can be a really cool tool that when all else fails it helps to just remove the rest of the anxiety symptoms any questions about the treatment models before we go into an actual case here okay so moving on of course if you have questions go ahead and type them in so the case example this is now agenda setting right specificity so we're assuming they've taken the invitation they want to do this work so for my client um, this is a client who's been through a, a sexual assault experience and her moment in time we go to specificity what is the problem you want to work on and then what is the moment in time when you struggled with that problem okay and just asking how do you use the hidden emotion tool what questions do you ask okay so going back to the hidden emotion I would just share with them, there's four treatment models for anxiety. One of them is the hidden emotion. Uh, when anxiety is often kind of out of the blue and you're not quite sure why, there, it may be a good chance that there's a hidden emotion going on. And so the hidden emotion treatment model says, when anxiety symptoms come about, there's actually something going on right now in the here and now, not from the past. Something going on in the here and now that's bothering you, or upsetting you or frustrating you, but it's being swept under the rug because you want to be nice and you don't want to rock the boat. And, uh, and then I start to just kind of prime the pump. Could, could there possibly be a, a hidden emotion going on for you right now? Like possibly you could be upset with your husband about something or your in-laws about something, or, you know, like I work with a lot of postpartum women, or you may actually want to go back to work, but you, 
you don't want to upset your your partner who wants you to stay at home with the child right so it could be I actually want to leave my job um, there's something in the here and now that's really bothering them so I'll give them a couple of examples and then I'll just kind of explore it with them in an open way and if they say no there's not, not nothing I can think of I let it go and kind of give it as homework for them to think about it's not uncommon that clients think of the hidden emotion as homework, but on occasion, I'll bring up the hidden emotion again. If they're talking about something um, that they haven't talked about before that's bothering them, but I know they're nice and they're conflict phobic, I would say, could that possibly be the, the hidden emotion? Um, do you see that your anxiety symptoms come about when your mother-in-law continues to be intrusive and, and calls you constantly? And then they would say, yes, anxiety does really increase every time I'm dealing with her. And so every session you just kind of explore, is there a possible hidden emotion? And, and don't let it go, just continue to bring it up. Um, you let it go if there's like, they're, they're not seeing a hidden emotion, but don't let it go for good, right? Likely in 80% of cases of anxiety, there's a hidden emotion. So there's a good chance that you'll come across something. And then you do communication training with them. And once you find the hidden emotion, they have to do something about it in order for the anxiety symptoms to, to go away or to get better. Okay, was that clear in answering your question there, Angela? I love the hidden emotion. I think it's a powerful tool that once, when the cognitive tools haven't been as effective and exposure, like cognitive tools take them to a certain level, exposure takes them to another level of healing, but a lot of times it's the hidden emotion that can take them all the way. Okay, so specificity, the moment in time was last Sunday, um, my client was enjoying time with her family, and then she had an intrusive memory about the sexual assault. So we do the moment in time, this is kind of the daily mood log, uh, just a snippet of it for those who aren't familiar with the Team CBT toolkit. Um, in the toolkit, you'll get a daily mood log where your clients can identify the moment in time, all of the emotions they were feeling, and then they'll identify the thoughts. So to save time, obviously my client had a lot of other thoughts, like, I mean, emotions like guilt, sadness, anger, um, but to save time for today, we're just focusing on her anxiety and panic. So then she felt anxious and panicky at about a 90%. The thoughts that she had in that moment, so I would, I would ask her, what, what were kind of the thoughts you were telling yourself as you were having that intrusive memory? Um, her thoughts were, I'll be stuck like this forever. You can see how that could drive anxiety and hopelessness. I should be over this by now. A lot of our clients feel incompetent in dealing with life when symptoms come up because they think I should be stronger than this. I'm weak for still struggling with it. I, I should be over it by now. He'll always, he'll always have power over me, that helpless feeling where they still feel unsafe and the world is unsafe. Um, I should have said no and fought harder. There's often regret thoughts, self-blame thoughts. It's my fault. And most men can't be trusted, so the world isn't safe. So the cognitive tools will often help a lot of these other self-blame um, thoughts like the one through five, but usually like most men can't be trusted or the world isn't safe. We'll really need exposure to help change those thoughts. Like usually just doing cognitive tools and sitting there isn't as effective as actually facing those fears or those environments that have felt unsafe to them. Okay, so then I would share with them the rationale for exposure. A lot of my clients would say, I get bombarded with these triggers and memories of the trauma every day already. Isn't that enough exposure? I feel these symptoms all the time already. Isn't that enough exposure? And the answer is no, because um, usually the exposure is brief and then they'll often avoid it and try to distract from it, which then actually inadvertently prolongs the trauma symptoms. Again, the two things that prolongs the post-traumatic symptoms is the negative thoughts that we have about ourselves about that moment in time or about that event, and then avoidance. The more I avoid it, the more the world continues to feel unsafe. So being bombarded with the triggers and then avoiding it actually prolongs their struggle, uh, which is kind of counterintuitive, but just how it works there. Exposure that works for the client has to be deliberate, it has to be repeated and it has to be prolonged. This is the only exposure that will really help to heal the trauma symptoms and decrease excessive fear. 
we have to be willing to deliberately face that monster and repeatedly do it and, and prolong it. So it's not just one time, um, but doing it over and over again um, for a longer period of time, right? And the reasoning I would kind of give them is, um, you know, when we continue to avoid the trauma, it feels like that monster continues to haunt us and come after us and jump out of the bushes. Um, but when we're willing to, it takes some courage. It takes some courage in the, on the therapist part too, because I can honestly say I always still feel a little bit nervous for the client, knowing how scared they'll be. Um, but really more often than not now, I, I feel kind of excited because I know how empowering this experience will be, how healing it will be. Um, but I, I tell them, you know, continue to come out and jump at you and come out of the bushes and, and still chase you. But when you're willing to finally face that monster, you'll allow your brain to activate that fear, but then relearn that you're actually safe. That trauma won't feel like it just happened yesterday anymore. So you'll see the monster doesn't have any teeth. The monster is not going to eat you up and that you do have power over it instead of it having power over you. The monster starts to shrink smaller and smaller, right? And that's habituation, that's learning. It's learning that the anxiety doesn't get worse when I stay in the feared situations. Um, the physiological symptoms and the emotional distress will start to decrease. And they'll learn that the world is overall safe and that they are competent in dealing with life and facing with life again. So exposure can really help them regain a, a sense of self and really regain their lives. Okay, prolonged exposure for PTSD. So I, I know you all like the role plays, but this one was a little bit more challenging for me to think of an exercise for a role play. I definitely didn't want someone to actually do any kind of personal work just for the hour and a half because that would be doing more harm. So I, so I hope you'll be okay with me just explaining some of the um, steps to you and then just sharing the specific case and how we dealt with it there. Okay, so prolonged exposure for PTSD. Exposure is for clients who have active PTSD symptoms. It's to treat PTSD, not to treat trauma, okay? So this isn't a tool just for you to throw at anyone who's been through trauma, because if they're not having active PTSD symptoms, it shows that there's already been some natural healing that has occurred for them. So the active symptoms that, are, that you'll see that this exposure will be important for them is like if they're still re-experiencing the trauma, they're still having intrusive memories, nightmares, flashbacks, there's intense distress when they face the triggers, whether they see something that triggered them or they're, they're feeling something that reminded them of the trauma. They're still actively avoiding the triggers um, and then they're uh, still having like a lot of arousal symptoms like it's hard for them to fall asleep. They may still have anger outbursts, really irritable, they're hypervigilant and constantly on guard, and they have a, a big startle response. Then these are the symptoms that will uh, prolonged exposure will be really effective for. Uh, we don't wanna use prolonged exposure if they've been through trauma, but they don't have these symptoms because there's really no point in kind of digging it up over and over again for them, right? Uh, which I have worked with clients who have had trauma, but it, it really doesn't actively affect them anymore. And it's definitely not a tool to make people dig up memories that possibly have been a trauma experience. So you may have had some clients who said, I think I may have been abused, but I'm not sure. It's just appeared in my life that I've forgotten. We don't want to do prolonged exposure with that either. It's not a tool to dig up memories of potential trauma because that may actually uh, do more harm and not be effective. So we want it to be a client who has sufficient memory of the trauma and they can articulate it from the beginning to the middle and the end. Okay, so the recommended time for prolonged exposure is um, three months after the trauma. Most people will actually have natural healing occur um, after three months of the traumatic experience. So before doing prolonged um, exposure, I often want to see that they've, there's been three months that has passed for them um, and giving time for the natural healing to occur. Um, the avoidance of the trauma, like I said, is what kind of prolongs the symptoms. But there's been research that has been shown that 
um, they've studied people like 12 weeks after a traumatic experience. And it was those who didn't talk about the trauma, avoided it, try to distract from it that had higher PTSD symptoms. So talking about it is a form of exposure in and of itself. And the more that people did that, they had less PTSD symptoms than those that just avoided talking about it completely, who tried to ignore it, uh, push it away. If there's current active drug and alcohol use, this also won't work. So what Dr. Burns talks about is active use of benzos. So benzos are like Xanax, Clonopin. Those actually prevent the client from fully experiencing the fear in order for the exposure to work and get them all the way to healing. It kind of just continues to put the lid on the ability to experience the anxiety and then it kind of prevents the healing. And, and it could also be used as another form of avoidance, right? So if they're doing exposure and then they're drinking it away, um, you can see how that wouldn't be effective either. So it's very important that they either do a concurrent treatment program and that you continue to monitor their substance use, that it's not being used as a form of avoidance. Um, otherwise, it'll counter your treatment. Okay, so the first thing, um, I discuss with my client is in vivo exposure. So I'm again, that case is a woman who's been sexually assaulted. She's spending time with her family and then had intrusive memories of the sexual assault. So with in vivo exposure, you wanna construct a hierarchy of the situations that they've been avoiding. So this is an, an anxiety slash avoidance hierarchy. And it doesn't have to be an exhaustive list, but you do want it to be representative of the experiences that they've been avoiding on the scale of how anxious it makes them. So you wanna see like maybe there's some things that create 30% anxiety, and then you want a representative uh, scenario where if you were to face it right now, you'd feel 60% and then 70, and then have an incremental reflection of the, the uh, situations that they're avoiding, right? And it'll be representative. And it's good to have about 10 to 15 situations. And it's also important to be really specific. Like what are the scenarios? What time of day is it that will make them more anxious when they're alone or with others? Because maybe going to the supermarket with her husband didn't create anxiety at all. But going alone, especially around the time that she was assaulted, around seven, um, even though she was at home, but now like just being alone created anxiety for her. So having a specific time, whether you're alone or with others, a specific place makes the hierarchy more effective. Our goal with in vivo exposure is that they eventually do these situations that are objectively safe, um, that are truly safe. You're wanting them to step out of their comfort zone, but not outside of their safety zone, right? So I'll share that with my clients too. The exposure is going to have you step outside of your comfort zone, but we're not going to have you step outside of your safety zone. We want things that are still truly objectively safe for you, but they just don't feel safe. So we can retrain your body into knowing that you are okay right now. So symptoms, the symptoms that our clients experience when they're really anxious and panicky about what they've been through is the exact same symptoms that came up when the true danger happened. It's the same symptoms that come up if a bear were to run after us and try to attack us right now. The, the panic attacks kind of is that rush of adrenaline that helps us to fight or flight, right? Uh, blood may rush from our head and our extremities, so we feel kind of numb or tingly, uh, maybe even lightheaded or foggy, so the blood can go to the big muscles so we can fight or run. Um, just many of the other symptoms that increase heart rate and breathing to get more oxygen so we can fight the situation. So your body is just thinking right now it still needs to protect you from danger and we need to retrain it that you are overall actually safe. Okay, so this was the actual hierarchy of my client. So responding to initiation of, of sex from her husband became quite anxiety provoking. Uh, spending time with an old friend who knew the perpetrator uh, so the perpetrator was an, an ex uh, an ex boyfriend, and so she started to avoid fr mutual friends that they've had to, even though it was a friend she really cared about and connected with. Um, writing a letter to the perpetrator, talking to her husband about the abuse, she still really didn't quite go there. He knew something happened, but didn't really know uh, the details. 
and then it happened in her mom's attic when she was just hanging out with him and so she just avoided her mom's house a lot but especially the attic um, and so facing that was actually one of the experiences that would be important for her. Other examples uh, for clients who have been through trauma is like they avoid then watching the news, they avoid watching certain movies, right? Listening to songs that they've heard during that scenario could be a great in vivo um, exposure. Um, uh, my, my client who was the vet, he, he would never have his back to doors like even if it was just in my therapy office, he's like, I have to always see the doorway. So the in vivo exposure was have your back to the door and, and do it as long as you can. And then we prolong it too. Being in a crowd, of course, then they just don't feel safe. Um, isolation feels more safe for them. Um, being alone at home, but sometimes um, being with others that feels unsafe to them. So it's just having to cater it to what feels most anxiety provoking for the client and having them face it, right? Okay, and then this is just the homework that um, the client would do. So it's, it's March the 5th at this time, I'm gonna do the exposure of going to the attic now. This was the last one that she did. So anxiety before, anxiety after, and then what was your peak anxiety? So you see as time goes on, the anxiety would decrease. Sometimes it may de increase a little bit too. So don't be surprised if it kind of wax and wanes, but overall you'll see a natural decrease if, if they are willing to pull up the courage to do this exposure, right? And then she, her first time was 4 p.m., but the assault was around 8 p.m. And so that was one that we made sure that she would do exposure around that time. And then the anxiety after, and then what was the peak anxiety during? And then you'll see that they'll start to feel a little bit more empowered in this process that it no longer has power over me. I can be empowered and have, and kind of take my life back. And so that's why exposure can be pretty exciting when we start to see those results for them. And don't be surprised when the symptoms get worse, right? And I would warn them about that too, that sometimes the symptoms will get worse. So you see the peak anxiety gets to 100, gets to 60%. Um, I've, I've, like the specific client, when we were in the middle of it, like maybe the third or fourth session, she's like, I feel like I wanna die. I, I, I don't know if I can continue to do it anymore. It feels horrible. And what would be the most empathic response when you see a client wants to run the other way from the sewage pipe? They don't wanna go through and see if there's fresh air. I don't know if I'll see the fresh air, the sunlight. What is the most empathic thing to do when they say they, they don't want to do this anymore and you've started the exposure? Because our instinct is gonna wanna not be there. I mean, wanna take them away from it. Let's stop, let's pause. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so Jill is saying, yes, we can sit with her and have some empathy, right? Like, yeah, I know this is painful. Um, and maybe you could even self-disclose if you've been through something yourself. But what Angela is saying, keep moving forward, is truly the most empathic thing that you can do with, for them. Jessica is saying, acknowledging how difficult it is to purposely put yourself in this situation. So kind of like what Jill is saying, give them empathy, right? Um, honoring that they already survived. Yeah, so give them some empathy, but then you wanna actually quickly move forward. And that may even feel a little bit harsh, but it's like, yeah, I, I know it's, it's, it's really painful, but you're actually doing a really great job. And this shows me, I do some positive reframing when these symptoms are really increased. This shows me that you're truly diving into the exposure. And these are actually the signs that we look for in order to, to know that the exposure is going to be effective for you is that you're doing it full force and you're facing the monster. And, and then I would say, look, you're doing a great job. Let's keep going. Right. Um, what kind of message would we give them if we say, okay, let's stop. I, I think this is too much. Um, let, let's go back to maybe supportive listening for several sessions and, and maybe not even go back there. 
Carmen's saying, it does feel uncomfortable. What, what can we do? Just more validation. Uh, validation and then actually kind of some positive reframing and moving forward, right? Like, like, I know this is really painful, but this actually shows me you're really diving into it and you're doing a great job and let's keep moving, right? Um, okay, Angela says, like, when we back off, it kind of shows us that then we're also scared of their anxiety symptoms. We, we're also scared of the trauma that has happened to them, right? Um, that we can't handle their anxiety, that we, we don't think this will work for them. And, and re really, it kind of gives the message, we don't think they can handle it. We don't think they can really face the trauma. And so it kind of takes some courage from us as the therapist, too, to, to tell them, let's keep going and do some positive reframing of the symptoms and then move forward. Um, Dr. Burns actually even says when we're doing exposure, it's actually important to not fall back to empathy, to not say, oh, I know this is hard and let's process it a little bit. Uh, it's actually crucial to say, he, he even goes a little bit farther on like, um, this is really important to move forward. You, you must do this, let's keep going. Um, you know, and then kind of just encourage and, and, and then move forward from there. It's the one time we push. It's the one time we don't actually completely fall back to processing and supporting and trying to explore the emotions. It's the one time we push them forward through the sewage pipe. It's actually the most empathic thing we can do because the message is, I know it's scary, but I know you can do it. And, and I believe in you and I'm right here with you at the gates of hell and we're gonna keep walking through it together. So in vivo exposure is important for them to feel empowered in those everyday situations. So usually we'll see avoidance of situations that um, triggered the, the trauma, but we also see them start to avoid the things that they used to enjoy. And so it's important to have that, like my client, we had that exposure of let's hang out with that friend again. That's the thing that you used to enjoy. Um, let's go to, you know, if they like to go to the movie theater that would be an important in vivo exposure to let's restart that and show yourself that you are safe and you are okay more often than not. Right? Then we get to imaginal exposure, cognitive exposure, and you wanna make sure you have enough time for the client, especially the first time. So I usually do an hour and a half session for the first time we're doing cognitive exposure. And you wanna make sure you give them at least 45 minutes for that first time to do the exposure. And when we do cognitive exposure, I first uh, want to overall understand what they've been through, but we're just going to target one memory. We, so, you know, a lot of our clients, it's not just a one-time thing. They've been sexually assaulted and then maybe it's happened again, or they've been through war over and over again with life-threatening situations. So with my client, she would have, um, you know, a, that one specific memory would haunt her and we would just target that. So the cool thing about Team CBT is you can be specific and you target that one memory and it usually helps ease all of the symptoms. You don't have to go through every single thing they've been through from beginning to end in order to heal their trauma symptoms. Um, my guy who was a veteran, he would have actually two specific memories. So he, he, he's been through life-threatening situations for like over 10 years in the force. But it was actually two specific memories that continued to haunt him and bother him and come back. And so those were the ones that we targeted, okay? And once you target one, you see that you don't have to go through all digging up everything that they've been through. So what I do in session with her um, and with my guy is you, you go through it and you have them walk you to it from beginning to end. And it's important to do that because we'll see they'll often prevent that from happening with distraction. Even when they're having a nightmare, they're likely to wake themselves up so they don't really see it go all the way through, right? And the flashback is even their body's way of trying to expose themselves to the situation, but then they'll often try to distract it and shake it out or, or avoid it in some way. So we want them to go from beginning to middle to end and record it and every, every, uh, every day I would have them listen to the recording of their story at least 30 minutes. Um, the recommended time is actually 40, 45 minutes up until they no longer feel as much of the, the anxiety symptoms. So when it gets down to about 20% is when uh, 
is kind of our aim of the goals here. Uh, imaginal exposure, again, you know, it's really very similar to EMDR. I did EMDR for uh, several years. And I, in, in the research with prolonged exposure, we actually see that EMDR and prolonged exposure were both equally effective soon after for the client. But we saw that like six weeks after um, the treatment, the prolonged exposure clients actually had uh, just better symptoms, better symptoms of wellness. And I think it's because, uh, they're not quite sure why, but, but to me, I think it's because with EMDR, it feels like you have to depend on the therapist in order to go there to that space. With imaginal exposure and prolonged exposure, you yourself are facing that monster and you are showing yourself that you are okay. So long after the treatment, uh, you can still feel okay because you were the person who walked yourself through that. Right? And I think imaginal exposure is also a little bit more powerful in that um, there's just, it's controversial. But it's been argued that the eye movement in EMDR has, is just kind of like a distraction that can soften the anxiety experience. And so when we do imaginal exposure, there's no distractions. They're diving into it, eyes closed, talking about it in the present tense from beginning to end. So it helps them create new perspective, new meaning, and um, Sorry, I'm trying to re read through my notes to see. I'm trying to add more details because some of the feedback was you wanted a little bit more meat in the in the presentation. Um, can target, okay, so I already went through all of that. You can target another memory once you see this target memory has really decreased in being able to affect them physically and emotionally. And, and I forgot to add this in the PowerPoint that I sent to you, but I, I want them to walk through it in the present tense um, you know, it's Sunday, uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, having fun with my family, and then, you know, my boyfriend asked me to go to my mom's house, we're just hanging out, um, and then he comes at me, right? So it's the present tense, and it feels uh, frightening, but uh, quite a bit more powerful in the healing process there for them. It's truly facing that monster without having to soften it or protect them in a certain way. Because the quicker you allow them to activate that fearful force, the more it has the ability to just burn out. Right? Okay, Angela, do you have documentation on that? I'd like to share this with my supervisor, not team. Um, yes, it's some of the, uh, I, I could send it to you on, on some of the readings that I've had. Like you're talking about just the research. I can send you the snippet of it in the article. Okay, what's going on here? Oh my goodness. 